So when we start looking into ideas like regenerative cultures, you can see it in a way of like the ways that we've learned how to treat one another, which kind of links to the social justice element, is ways of using each other, abusing each other, and treating each other like shit, to be quite honest. And what we've done is taking that same energy to the earth, but the earth is kicking us out like we're bad tenants, and that's what's happening with climate change. And the only way we can really resolve the issues with the environment and climate is by solving the ways that we treat one another and putting love, duty and care at the heart of everything we do. And this is kind of where I feel that COVID has really highlighted that for us of what can society look like when we help each other. You're listening to the Spaceship Earth podcast with me, Dan Burgess. The concept of the Spaceship Earth is simple. We live on a life-giving rock called Earth hurtling through space. Like a spaceship, we have a finite amount of supplies with an intelligent operating system which keeps everything we need replenished as long as we all respect it and use wisely. So an understanding of how this system works, along with deep cooperation between humans and all life, is essential to keep us thriving and the spaceship flying. In this podcast, I'm in conversation with humans involved in regenerating life, shifting consciousness and reimagining how we can live more beautifully and peacefully. I talk with artists, activists, writers, designers, adventurers, healers, entrepreneurs, creative mavericks, and more. Their stories invite us to participate in the co-creation of a more beautiful, life-sustaining world in service to life, becoming crew on the Spaceship Earth. Hi, how's it going? This is Dan. Welcome to the show. It means a lot to have you here. Um, So thanks for tuning in. Uh, In this episode, I'm in conversation with Daze Agaji. So Daze is a 21-year-old climate justice activist uh, and someone I've been following um, from afar since I saw her pop up Uh, with Extinction Rebellion in London back in uh, sort of early 2019. Um, Quite recently, actually, I was hosting a panel on community activism uh, where Daze was a guest and um, just absolutely loved her energy and views and perspectives on the the changes we, um, we all need to be making as a species when it comes to the intersections of climate um, the climate ecological crisis, social justice and inequalities. And, you know, the, the, the work that she's doing to catalyze um, like beautiful action in that whole space. So I was really excited uh, when Daisy was up for, a, up for a chat. So, um, yeah, let's cut to it. This is episode 46 of the Spaceship Earth podcast with Days Agaji. Days, welcome to the Spaceship Earth podcast. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Where, where, um, whereabouts are you on the on the spaceship Earth right now? Uh, so I live in London, actually. I live uh-huh. in beautiful Blackheath. Um, so that's where I am. Nice. And has that been? Because um, I guess, God, you know, it, lockdowns and things have just got. Um, obviously, have just sort of changed changed everything. Is that has that been pretty much where you've been for the last? I don't know how long has it been. It's been, it's been forever. It's been now. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was a year this weekend. <laughs> it was, yeah, you're right. It is, isn't it? Yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, I used to live in New Cross actually, but um, since like uni is all online and New Cross, it's, I love New Cross, but it's not the greatest place to spend lockdown. The first time around, I understood that. So this time I decided to go somewhere that's a bit more leafy bit nicer <laughs> yeah 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 the 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 the, the sort of visible na- nature and yeah. uh, i'm sure we'll i'm sure we'll tuck into that in this in this conversation <laughs> and um so listen thank you so much for uh for finding time for this. i'm really excited to to explore um you know your work and your world and a lot of the you know threads and riffs i think that are, are common to a lot of my my inquiry so i'm really excited to 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 hear and and just the way you're you're seeing what's unfolding 
for all of us right now, which is quite a lot. <laughs> and uh, it'd be really cool just to have a little bit of your backstory, just like, you know, just give us a little bit of a sense of um, what's got you to now and what does now sort of look like for you in terms of, you know, your main kind of focus areas. And then we can dig mm. into to the to the deep stuff. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, so where, where do I start? <laughs> no, I like to start from the beginning of my life because I feel like a lot of my younger years was very formative and mm. how I like how I see the world now um, and the work that I do. So I actually grew up in London in Tottenham was my where my first home was. It was in a one bedroom flat where I lived with my brother and my my two brothers and my mum and my dad. Um, and at this point, we actually lived in poverty um, in the UK. Mm. And um, that's how I grew up for a, a large portion of my childhood. So you um, work because you're, you're, how old are you now? So we just give us some, I'm, some times. I'm turning timelines. 21 on Saturday. Amazing. <laughs> so this would have been what? What was the, um, you, this would have been. So your... that would have been from around, like from when I was born till I was around eight years old. Yeah. Um, and then my mum, she, like, she tells the story so much better than I did, but she had a dream of where she owned her own restaurant. And after that dream, she actually decided to follow it, um, quite literally. <laughs> um, and it it's, was very lucky. Um, she, bear in mind, like, we didn't have money. Um, yeah. But things fell in place really weirdly, but correctly. Um, there was a woman who was prepared to basically give my mom the property uh, for free and get my mom to pay her back after six months. Um, my church helped out a lot um, in helping my mom get the money um, to start. So it was very much like a dream come through for my mom. And through mm. that, we actually changed our situation. Um, so this was the early, this is like early 2000s. I was just doing that. I was just trying to do the maths um, in terms <laughs> yeah. of the, it's around then, isn't it? Because I, I, the reason it's funny because I, 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 I lived for twenty years in in Harringay near Arsenal. So, uh, so it's just it just make it. I was trying to just figure out what was I doing at that time. It's quite interesting. Um, <laughs> was it early two thousands? Would that be right? Sort of. Yeah, it would be the early two thousands. Um, my mum started her restaurant around that kind of two thousand and eight kind of time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but then after that very middle class, very quickly. Um, I ended up actually going to boarding school for secondary. And this is where the environment kicks in. Hmm. Um, so I went to boarding school in Lincolnshire. Yeah, That's when I learned how to love the land. I was so like, so unaware of nature, the ideas of nature, taking care of nature, being in nature was so alien to me growing up in like an inner city world. Yeah. Um, and then my house parents were basically hippies. And I, the first thing <laughs> I actively remember learning was how to take care of chickens and how to take care of a wormery. <laughs> Amazing. So you yeah. went so out of, out of, out of, you know, um, North London and then to Lincolnshire. So that must be quite, yeah. So like everything was a big shift, I'm guessing. Exactly. Of... Absolute culture shock. Like I, it was the first time I saw a cow. <laughs> oh, wow. A cow, yeah. Like I, the first time I saw a cow, What's I was that? Like, eleven, <laughs> which is so crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and and I really just learned how to love nature, and I feel like I, I felt like this real connection to it, and learning how to grow your own food and take care of the land. Um, it was just really formative. But when I came back to London when I was sixteen for college, yeah, it was actually when I started getting quite ill. Um. I ended up developing uh, asthma that I used to have when I was really young, but it went when I was in Skegness yeah. for the most part, um, and also some skin issues as well. And I kept wondering what's going on because I've never had anything like that. Um, and the doctors weren't really giving me any answers. So I started Googling as every 16-year-old would. <laughs> mm, mm. I didn't find some weird WebMD like diagnosis of something really serious, but I actually found out about air pollution. Um, and the effects of air pollution on people in London and in big cities, but also the effects of air pollution and how it disproportionately affects working class and um, communities of colour. Mm. And this was, I think, the real spark for me of really understanding what's going on and, and looking into that and looking into climate change, understanding the severity of the issue that we found ourselves in. Um, and then after this, I did go angry, angsty teenager for many years and did nothing about it, <laughs> but complained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Till I got to university and my friend, she went to an Extinction Rebellion protest. And that's um, 
where she told me, she was like, yeah, let's go to a meeting. Um, and at this point, I was super depressed. I had um, depression. I also had meningitis. So I was very much like I had nothing else to be doing. Um, so I decided to go with her. And that meeting changed the course of my life um, quite literally. I feel like it, it. people always say that, but I, I mean it, you know. Um, tell us about that. Tell us about, tell us more about that. What yeah. Was... So at this point we actually, so Extinction Rebellion was in a office in, on Warren Street. Yeah. I remember that. This is, 20, is this 2018 or 2019? 20, it would have been early 2019 20, at this yeah. point. Um, but yeah, so we, so we went there and we were waiting outside because we knew it was the office, but we were just way too scared to go in. So <laughs> me and my friend were literally just talking ourselves out of not going to the meeting and going to the pub instead. And then a lovely woman called Amy came out and she said, hi loves, are you guys looking for Extinction Rebellion? And we were like, yeah. <laughs> then she was like, come on in. <laughs> and she took us in. She showed us like what was happening, showed us around the office. And I think just that, that moment of kindness, you mm. know, it was just, it was so groundbreaking, you know. And especially was that unex when, unexpected for you? I think so. Growing up in London, you know, you don't talk to strangers. You, <laughs> you yeah, don't even true. look at strangers on the tube or on the bus. So it was very yeah. much like someone just being kind for kindness sake was quite like, wow. Um, mm -hmm. And then also when we started going into the meeting and with the check-ins, which is um, a part of like Exiles Regenerative Culture, where we check how we are doing. Um, and I was, I, I'm not gonna lie, the first time I did a check-in, I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Like, why would you ask? Um, because I wasn't fine, but it had been so long since someone genuinely asked me, how was I doing? Um, and to have the space to just not always like have to be happy, but also just say I'm I'm finding this really difficult and mm. I think I need help was just really it, it really changed everything. And from then I, I started um, after this meeting um, of meeting really amazing people, I ended up starting to work for Extinction Rebellion the Monday after. So from that Wednesday to the Monday. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant, um, love it. Was, it. Uh, plotting. And then at that time, it was the build up to April Rebellion. Um, yeah. And I met um, a couple of people from XR Youth. Um, and that's kind of how I got into climate activism in the way that I am involved now. So interesting, because it's sort of like if you sort of pinpoint out, you know, you, you had this sort of, you know, your own, you know, your own sort of personal awakening to this kind of living world in, with school and, and the natural world. And, and then you sort of came back into the city vibe, got got ill by the sounds of things and and mm -hmm. then started noticing which is again i mean you know we, we've all you know many reasons for for all of these things but it's interesting that you in your exploration started to connect it with these environmental factors and issues around us that were impacting your health and finding that doorway going through that doorway into this which is again quite um yeah, I think it's quite interesting because it's kind of a it's a it's a felt experience, isn't it? It's not sort of exactly. often with climate and activism, we tend to you know many people tend to think of sort of things you know abstract, far away mm -hmm. climate or, but actually having a very sort of um, you know individual yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah because I I would always say like the more I unlock the memories of my past, I realize that I think most young people at this age can realize their life was a story of climate change. Because mm. um, even like when I was young, I remember my mum would always tell us to wind up the windows and we would never get why, but it's because we would go past an incinerator that was burning in the middle of our community, uh, you know? And it's like when I was in um, Lincolnshire, we would have yearly flooding and we would just think it's just seasonal flooding as though that was a normal thing to happen, you know? And it's like when you start looking back, you're seeing elements of climate change play in your life, but us being almost totally unaware that it's happening yeah it's um doesn't um i can't remember there's a term for this isn't there this sort of uh george mombio talks about this but it's that sort of what's it called is it baseline or it's something you know it's you it's what you're you, whatever you're born into whatever the, you know the age that you arrive on this earth mm. whatever you see around you you imagine is just the way things have always been you know you've, mm. you've got nothing else you can't process that there was you know multiple you know i remember back in the you know, i was born in the 70s i remember the 
the kind of you know the insect storms you know the moths you know hum- in the summers you know you'd have like the front windscreens of my my mum's car would just be covered in moths and insects <laughs> you know and and because you you know when you're driving there'd be so many drawn towards the light mm. but that doesn't happen anymore do you know what I mean but yeah we, so these 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 things that we experience and we only you know we we sort of imagine we it's very hard for us to imagine what came before um or that something else existed um but yeah no so, so you so you got into the because i think that so i came across you at, you know with extinction rebellion I, I i remember seeing seeing you uh, uh in some communication actually and then and then and then i think i saw you was probably just after that april rebellion but then it was in the autumn of 2019 with the global climate strikes mm. And I think because you because 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 you were uh, you were featured in the the Patagonia work around facing extinction, weren't you? That's right. Yes, I was. I was yeah. one of the many amazing climate activists um, who were talking about what's it like to be young in this time of, you know, where we are fighting to save not just us but the natural world that we love. It's you know. Yeah, what was that like? What was that like to sort of go? Because again, all this happened. This is all this is all happening quite fast, yeah. really, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think to be honest, like I'm oh, okay. So before Extinction Rebellion, I had planned my whole life out to the T. For the rest of my life, I knew exactly what I'd want to do. And I've done that since I was young. I always had a plan of, okay, this is the university I want to go to, this is the course I'm going to go to. And I'm constantly working towards that plan. But when XR just totally upended my life, <laughs> um, I decided that I'm not going to plan anymore and I'm just going to go with what the universe throws at me, you know. And I feel like that whole, especially the year of 2019, was just absolutely crazy from, you know, April Rebellion, which was like two weeks of total awe that I feel like unless you were there, you can't really explain how... Mm. Like visionary and groundbreaking it was to you know running for election Leonardo DiCaprio posting about my story you know it's like and then like going on I that summer I went on a tour around Europe doing talks and speeches um about basically what I'd been doing and it was just there that this really crazy like from just being an average university student to just being open to so much more um, yeah so I'm let's let's just so let's just let's just rewind there because that's a lot. So so there was so you had you start because you 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 you're studying. Are you still studying? You are still studying, aren't you? I'm in my you're, third year. I'm I'm getting through it. <laughs> Final term. Yeah. And that's it's tell us a little bit. So because because then we'll we'll go into the the European stuff as well. But like so you you XR happened. Uh, you already started at um, where is Gold- it Goldsmiths? Yeah. yeah. I, I would have been at Goldsmiths for around, like, probably around, like, it was the second term. So it would have been, like, a couple months. Um, I would have been at Goldsmiths by this point. And what are you studying? I'm studying history and politics. Right. And this, because so there's, so just so for the listeners, but because in that year of 2019, you also ended up um, become, uh, try, uh, on the campaign trail for a, become a European Member of Parliament, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which so just tells about, because that's, you know, that's, that's a, 2019 was a big year for you, wasn't it? It's like, so t- tell us, wh- how did that all come? How did that all happen? What what was the okay. catalyst for that? Yeah. So to be honest, like, it's so funny because it's like, I wish I was like, I was totally brave and I decided to do this. But technically, that's not actually what happened. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, after April, we were just in the XR office, and I can't remember like what was going on, but we were just all chatting about like this, the European election, and how it's kind of funny because it's not technically meant to be happening anymore because of Brexit, um, and how like it's really weird how we've just cr- had like a really big moment of acknowledging the climate crisis, but it feels like we're going to be pulled back into the Brexit debate um, just straight after. So we were there and then Roger, um, the co-founder of XR, was talking about it with us. And then he asked me, he was like, Dave, if you got the opportunity, would you run for European Parliament as a candidate? And I went, fuck yeah, uh, was my instant response. But I was like, I'm broke. I don't have any money. <laughs> You know, I'm a, I'm a broke student. <laughs> um, and then he was like, if I could find the money, would you do it? And I was like, yeah, I would love to do it. I think it would be great. 
there was a part of me that I think the large part of me did not actually think he would get the money. But lo and behold, 24 hours later, I was signing the paperwork to become a candidate for the MEP um, electoral race. Amazing. And that's how it started. And when, (laughs) you know, once someone's like put so much faith in you, especially to give their own money. You're like, oh shit, I've got to do this now. (laughs) Well, exactly. And I just started sitting down and thinking like, what do I think I want politics to be? And that's kind of where I based a lot of the campaigning um, strategy around. It was like, what what do I want to bring to politics that might not be there already? I wanted to bring the average person's voice. You know, I'm I'm at that time I was a 19 year old student from London, um, and I was like, yeah, why can't I be a politician? Um, why do we have to have our politicians being churned out of Eton? Why can't it just be average people saying? I deserve a better democracy and doing just that. Um, But also making sure that climate is at the heart of the discussions that we were having and bringing back that attention um, to the climate crisis um, so it's not forgotten. And what, I mean, you know, that's quite a big thing to to do. Um, What, what, can you just share some of the, some of what that journey, you know, of being a candidate and campaigning was like, what did you learn from it? What was, what, what, you know, what, what, what sort of, yeah, what were your reflections now on, on that? Yeah, I think it was absolutely crazy. One, like the fact that you have to put up so much money to even get into the race, I think is ridiculous. And I think we need to start asking whether it's truly democratic. If you've like, I think the, the initial cost was 5,000 pounds just to get on the ballot. Um, which most people don't have. And that's creating a barrier to entry for politics. Yeah. So that's that's one thing that I was very shocked at. And I do think that as a society, we really need to start looking at the money that goes into democratic processes um, and how can we change it so everyone can partake, whether that's voting or being a candidate. Um, but also, I think, at least for me, it was making sure that I don't do what traditional politicians do and talk at people and not really hear what's happening in the communities, but try and sell myself. And the whole idea was like, you know, I statistically, it would have been very impossible for me to win. So I want to come together with different communities and start talking about the issues that we hold really closely to our hearts. You know, we did some conversations around gentrification in Brixton um, and had communities talking about what was happening and how we can end up helping each other. I did a tea with your MEP candidate where you could book me online for lunches and dinners. Um, (laughs) And I will come with cake and teas and we can talk politics and and be honest about things, you know. And it was this really amazing learning process. But also there was a little bit of MBDA in the mix as well um, (laughs) of where um, there were actions being done um, around the election. Um, And I think the funniest part of this was like, um, the backdrop of all of this was the fact that I was in my exam period and <laughs> any single time I would go anywhere, I'd bring like all my textbooks with me Brilliant. so I could revise at the same time. <laughs> Brilliant. Love that. Yeah, it was, it was really, it was, yeah, it was such an amazing process, but also it did show a lot of cracks in our dem- democratic process and lots of places we could do better and we should be aiming to do better in. What was your what did, what did your family make of all this at the time? Because you you got you got you know you got you're you're campaigning to become a uh, a member of European Parliament. You're on kind of billboards and newspaper adverts with with Patagonia around with a sort of facing extinction plastered across your face. And uh, it must have been quite. How did how did how did, what's that like? You know what was that like with um, you know did people around how do people around you respond to this? You know your your you know this wave of yeah. different direction you've gone in. I think, um, oh, I think, I think they were quite shocked because especially like, to be honest, like, I feel like through this journey, I found myself and my voice a lot. And like before I was, I was quite quiet, um, like, especially around people I don't know. Uh, I wasn't much of a talker. Um, but I, I, yeah, I was, I was quite different before this whole journey. Mm. And I know when my mum, like I was telling my mum when I first joined Extinction Rebellion, she went, you're going to join those crazy people who try to get arrested. <laughs> and she was so shocked. And I was like, mom, and trying to explain the whole thing. And she was just uh, like, she just couldn't believe it. And then when I told her about April and I went, mom, we're going to try and block central London. Um, 
She laughed at me and she told me, yeah, 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 that's good. On the morning of April the 15th, she called me and she said, is that you and your friends? <laughs> um, when she saw what was happening in um, central London. And I think it was this like real shock of that. I wasn't just talking out my ass, but this was something that was very much happening. Um, and especially with like running for election, it was just, I feel like my mum, that's when she really started to take my feelings about the climate seriously, because it's something that was very much out of, you know, out of character for me to do. Um, and when she saw I was prepared to make myself that uncomfortable in order to, you know, talk about the environment and make sure the environment is something that we don't forget. I think that's when it clicked for her where she 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 realized that she was, you know, that I, I meant business and I was quite serious about this and serious about what I was doing. And, you know, I had a conversation with her a couple of weeks ago for an article and it was the first time that we'd really talked about climate change. And it was nice to know that she's proud of me, although she thinks I could probably do it in more conventional ways. <laughs> Yeah, He's no, it's quite proud of me. <laughs> you call yourself, um, you would call yourself a climate justice activist. Yes. Can you just talk a little bit about what that means to you? Because I know people are hearing this term. It's un understanding what, what we really mean by this. Would you be able to talk a little bit to climate justice? Yeah. Um, okay. So I feel like um, when we talk about climate change, especially from a point of where the climate movement in the UK is, of where it's predominantly a very white and middle class space we talk about it in terms of carbon in terms of degrees as though that's the only way climate change is affecting us but sometimes we forget to understand that there is a social justice element to climate change it is the most marginalized who are facing the brunt who did not cause the issue especially when you start looking at you know areas in the global south which are very much experiencing cl climate change today um and when i say climate justice i don't mean just justice for the earth but it's justice for the people and every living thing on the earth um, and that's where it's a, it's taking a more holistic approach to climate change and including intersectionality at the heart of it yeah, and I guess, and and it's I guess the you know the like for instance 2020 and everything. I mean, COVID sense that we might yeah. maybe we've taken our eye off the climate issue, but yeah. in some ways, it's again it's revealed more and more of the injustice, the social justice. You know that, that so many people are experiencing the inequalities, right, of a system. Exactly. Um, and I guess also you know, which I'd love to explore a bit with you is because again, you know, it'd be interesting to see how this has affected you and your work over the last year. So there's obviously COVID and there's obviously, you know, the, the, um, the huge groundswell, um, resurgence of Black Lives Matter based obviously on the, you know, kickstarted through the, the murder of George, George Floyd last, yeah. last year as well. And so there's these, you know, you spoke a little bit to these, you know, intersectionality and stuff. So what, what's it been like for you and the work you're doing in, in the last year or so? Can you, can you talk a bit to us some of that? Yeah, I feel that like, like whenever you would say the, like the system is fucked before COVID, no one really quite understood what that meant. But when COVID happened, and especially at the beginning of where you started to see the way that governments will act in terms of crisis and the people who would be lost. It wasn't, you know, like, for example, with the stockpiling, um, people who can afford to ended up buying out the old shops. But what about the elderly people who couldn't? What about the disabled people? What about the people from lower economic backgrounds who couldn't do the same things? Who are the people who were given aid within those times? And it showed basically how the system does not work for all. And I think it actually kind of was that it was a real like highlighting moment for where we need to start figuring out how to make society a lot better. Um, I do think that like COVID was it's it's been a time of loss and grief for so many. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when you think about it, a lot of the deaths that have occurred shouldn't have happened, you know, and it just shows how inadequate governments can allow things to happen when they shouldn't. And I think these were the kind of, when when we started to look at, you know, like for example, linking it to climate change, um, I look at it holistically because it's not just about one part of it. It's not just about the climate. 
It's about the ways that we treat one another within this time. At that time, we chose greed and ideas of scarcity over caring for one another. This time has really shown us that the system is fucked and it's shown us all the areas that the system's fucked. And the climate, I feel like, is almost a byproduct of all of this. Um, So when we start looking into ideas like regenerative cultures, it's based kind of like it. you can see it in a way of like the ways that we've learned how to treat one another, which kind of links to the social justice element is ways of using each other, abusing each other and treating each other like shit, to be quite honest. And what we've done is taking that same energy to the earth. But the earth is kicking us out like we're bad tenants. And that's what's happening with climate change. And the only way we can really resolve the issues with the environment and climate is by solving the ways that we treat one another and putting love, duty and care at the heart of everything we do. And this is kind of where I feel that COVID has really highlighted that for us of what can society look like when we help each other? Like the amazing mutual aid communities that's popped up almost overnight at the beginning of lockdown to help the people who are the most marginalised out of this situation, but also put an eyes on the government about how incompetent they are um, and how we need a better democracy of where all of us can feel heard and all of us can be supported and protected. Um, So I do think that COVID, although it shouldn't have taken this to wake us up, but it it really has. And hopefully we won't go back to ignoring what's happening um, because sadly, this is only the first out of probably many crises we are going to face, at least in my lifetime, let alone beyond. Yeah, it's, 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 I often feel like sort of, you know, COVID sort of, lift, you know, lifted the lid on, you know, what was already there, right? It was mm. it, all, all of this sort of oppression and inequality and, you know, oppression of, of people, oppression of, you know, the non-human world, the living world. It was, mm. you know, it was all very much, you know, everything's been designed on that, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult and uncomfortable to sort of face into that, but that's effectively what, you know, you know, obviously, you know, in in our activism, we're, you know, we're sort of understanding this, but I think there's been this huge reveal in this last 12 months um, of that. And like you say, you know, you know, a a sort of a a, a climate that's breaking down and an ecology that break is breaking down is, is the byproduct of a system that is, you know, built on that kind of extraction of human spirit and, you know, natural, you know, extraction of material and, biodiversity and collapse and all these kind of things and so we're seeing this but it's so interesting i say when you speak to the like where you see the potent where you see the sort of the the regeneration or the healing is in this almost in this um in how we show up as people well as a collective i think that's the important part it's, mm. it's learning how to work with each other again um because i think that's this is why, like, do you know, like, when people are like, what can I do as an individual to solve climate change? I don't really entertain things like that because it's not like, you know, you can't give an individual solution for a collective issue, you know, and we need to start seeing each other as a society and a community together. And that's how we can learn how to solve the issues that we're in. It's doing it together. And I think, especially with, you know, like grassroots organisations that have popped up over the last couple of years, and working with and in them, you see how, even though, like, we may not be have the same background, we may not have the same understanding of the world, just for sharing the love of this planet and the love of the people and all living things on it, we can create such strength to do so many amazing things. And that just shows the power of collective action. We live on a life-giving rock called Earth, hurtling through space. How bonkers is that? You're listening to the Spaceship Earth podcast. You you do, um, I guess, increasingly... From what I understand, that you're you're doing quite a bit of work with with younger audiences, and also as you spoke to people of color and marginalized groups, mm. and also exploring that connection with the natural world within that. Can you what, what's what's drawing you to that, and and can you share some some stories about that type of work? Mm. I feel like for me, it's like you know, like for example, my my own like my own like identity is very much in like 
touching upon lots of different intersects. Like, you know, like I'm queer, I am a black woman <laughs> who yeah. came from poverty. And it's like lots of different parts of mine. I understand what it's like to be the marginalized person. Yeah. And I'm just lucky that I've been in an environment of where I've learned how to find my voice, but a lot of people don't get there. Um, and I feel like that's kind of where I come in. I try and help promote that space of holding um, and like a space of where people can find themselves. Because if we do, I don't think that what's happening will be happening because we won't allow anyone to tell us any otherwise from, you know, like governments telling us that they can't help solve the climate crisis or they can't do things quick enough. We would find our voices to say, you serve us as a government and us as a community, as a collective is saying we want more. And I think that's where my work comes in. It's working with communities to find their voice and ask for more because we just all deserve more than what we're getting. Um, and I think just having that personal like understanding of what it is to feel marginalized and what it is to feel oppressed has really made me really fucking angry because mm. I should have had to go through it through, through that. And if I can inspire the next generation to not take that and not have to go through that, that's the most powerful work I could probably be doing right now. It's, it, it's amazing listening to you because when you talked about the, you know, your whole sort of, you know, your, this you know you went down this kind of xr rabbit hole almost, and it's sort of like and but then you just kept saying yes to things and you sort of you know you said you found your voice through those experiences of campaigning and you know speaking up and being put in the limelight um and i'm guessing also you know as a sort of you know a middle-aged white guy that the you know that that's also a huge amount of like you took a lot of risks doing that because of who you are and the privilege that, you know, the white privilege that exists, particularly in protest and activism. Mm. Um, so, you know, what was that like? And, and again, it's interesting now you're, you're trying to bring that, trying to help others find their their voices. But there was something in your story about actually it was this, you know, letting yourself almost just trusting yourself to go and put yourself in these slightly uncomfortable situations was also part of how you kind of have found have found this this focus. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, to be honest, I think, doing the work that I do does make me, you know, like <laughs> prone to a lot of criticism and a yeah. lot of nasty comments as well. I've had my fair share of death threats, okay. uh, which yeah. to be honest, I, I've got like very thick skin, um, which I think from my childhood and having to grow up through so much adversity and still having to make it through has taught me. And also like my mum is like a real inspiration for me. My mum grew up in, you know, a, a small village in Nigeria of where she had to come to this country because um, her father died and my mum's like one out of like 10. Um, and she had to become one of the breadwinners at a very young age. And I, I've seen how she's literally raped herself from poverty and provided such an amazing life for us and the rest of our family. So it's like, if my mum can do it, sure is how I can. Because um, I know I've grown up in a certain amount of privilege just by even being in the UK and having um, education and, and things like this. So, um, so yeah, I think it, that's, that's helped me a lot within this kind of space. Um, but also like knowing when to stand up for myself as well um, has, has helped me a lot because I do feel like I can I can like back myself um, and hopefully if I bring that kind of support and security to other people to use their voices um, and we can learn how to protect each other I think that's really important in a space like this especially when I feel like groups like the youth and indigenous people and communities of colors and the working class should be at the center of these discussions because we are the groups that are facing the injustice the most yeah and is there's there's, there's something about this as well and this makes me think some and probably who know what the future should look like and what the solutions are those communities that have been most on the edges need to be the most in the center for for the for the redesign almost um mm -hmm. 
exactly and especially like the the more i think about it is like you know i'm i'm one of those people i think all of us have to be there even white men looking slightly <laughs> awkward <laughs> on the edges oh God, what's the, white, the, old, it's the old white dudes <laughs> <laughs> but i do think that you know like Maybe, maybe I'm harsh, but you know, the, like the the people who dominantly control the conversation um, have had more than enough time to solve this issue, but we still manage to find ourselves in it. Um, so I think this time we should start trying to fill in some of the back blind spots we've had within our activism and within our um, conversations around the climate and social justice issues, and start bringing in voices who haven't been heard, because that's that's where we're going to find the, you know, the golden egg, because these are ideas which haven't had the time of day. Um, and we can use these ideas to create really beautiful redemptive cultures of where we can start to acknowledge um, people within society and also make sure that we don't miss blind spots when creating these solutions. Because if we get a, you know, a climate plan that takes out all the carbon in the air, um, that's great. But also what about the injustices that allowed it to happen in the first place? Are we sorting those out, you know? And how would we know if we're sorting those out, we're addressing those issues if we're not discussing the people who face the burden of those issues? Yeah. And it's, I mean, again, sort of like it, my sort of simple mind as I get older tends to just go, always just go back to sort of looking to the non-human world and think, well, you know, the reason the natural world, when it's allowed to thrive, it, you know, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's because of its diversity. It's because of the multiple species and relationships and interactions mm-hmm. and flavors. And you know what I mean? That's what creates the beauty and the resilience. Whereas we have developed this monoculture in terms of how we you know, our institutions, what we think education looks like, what we think progress looks like, you know, it's so monoculture, you know what I mean? It's literally, it's stripped of its diversity. So even just in the, uh, it feels like, yeah, there's sort of this, 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 you know, this future, you know, it has to have lots of flavors and lots of ideas. Yeah, exactly. of um, what's, what's making you optimistic in terms of the projects or, or things that you're, you know, people you're working with, or give us a sense of like, you know, this year and, and things that are really getting you excited. Oh, to me, I, 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 I think. I know, you- I know it's a hard question <laughs> after what we've all been through as well, but it's like. No, no, I think you can't do this work if you're not optimistic. I'm, I'm really op- optimistic um, because what's the whole point of me doing this? I might as well go on as many flights as I can and eat as many beef burgers as I can if I don't think that we're actually going to get to a place of solving these issues, you know. <laughs> um, but I think uh, for me, at least, I know that my work with young people is what keeps me going. Like, Boris Johnson, hand over the keys, because, you know, some of the groups of 11 year olds I've been able to host workshops for and get them thinking about these ideas. I would allow them to be in government more than some of the MPs that currently, (laughs) you know, and it's just like young people have this really amazing thing of having such open views of the world, you know, and sometimes explaining some of the stuff that happens in the world, like, for example, like the use of fossil fuels or like certain aspects of democracy that are not working so well. When you explain it to them, they don't understand, not because they're not competent of not understanding, but it's because they really don't see how we got there. (laughs) You know, like I was explaining how like, um, you know, fossil fuels are made from the earth trying to bury them. Um, And then they come back because we dig them up and then we burn them. And they were like, what? (laughs) You know, that makes no sense whatsoever. I'm like, you, you're telling me <laughs> what we're burning old dinosaurs to make stuff. That we're just, right. yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, it's just like this, like really beautiful, like like na- naivety, but also this like beautiful vision. You know that they have for the future that they want to have and the future that they feel entitled to. And I do feel that when you start to grow up like certain, you know, like the vision that we would previously have are demolished by what we expect of the world and what we don't get, you know, like you're currently being shat on, whether it's, you know, like having to grow up, being marginalised and then trying to get a job and then getting a job and then having to work endless hours that make you unhappy, but also being stuck in catch-22 of not being able to live if you don't work um, and not being able to afford like basic necessities like food and shelter if you don't work. And it's like this kind of constant crushing of the human spirit that happens that doesn't allow us as adults to 
dream big and see big, you know, and hopefully with the young people that I work with, they will forever dream big and see big. And that's my aim to not allow and like have them create such great ideas and thoughts and spirits that the world cannot crush them. Um, that's, that's my aim at least. Yeah. I love that. There's, um, it, 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 it's, it's, um, I was listening to something recently was talking about, um, again, this sort of, you know, where we are in this, you know, at this civilization, whether, 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 however you want to describe it, whether it's collapsing, coming down, transforming, whatever you want to call it. But there's always a, there's, there's a, there's in this kind of modern, um, industrialized capitalist sort of way of being you know we've kind of monetized everything but we have we have very little story of consequence so we don't really understand the consequences of the decisions we're making all the time around you know consumption never-ending growth you know all these you know the access to resources there are these all these consequences do you know what i mean that we just Mm -hmm. we can't see them because we don't really in our culture this modern culture have I don't know, is it a moral, it's just something like we're not, yeah, we don't seem to have a sense of consequence, so we don't really understand. I think yeah. it, it's, at least, I I think it's that we're not really told that there are consequences. Right. If you, if you know what I mean, I do think that, maybe I'm being all conspiracy nutty here, but I do think that <laughs> the people who are in charge of the education system aren't teaching us what we need to, they're not going to tell us about how, bad certain industries are when those industries are the ones that are governing politics via large donations and money they're not going to tell us those things so we kind of like especially like with my own journey of like you know learning about democracy and finding my love for politics it was very much like this is how things are done and don't expect any other way you know so you work within the lines and I remember especially when joining XR you know, even the first time I heard that we were planning on shutting down central London, I said, but you can't do that. But, <laughs> but you can't do that. And they were like, why? Why can't we do that? And I was like, good question. <laughs> you know, because we are so conditioned to like yeah. within that box. And that yeah. box, wow, a lot of shit to happen. Huge amount. We were given, you know, like the space to really question and ask things and have like knowledge on, you know, what are the consequences of a lot of our actions? I do think that people will change. But if we would change, and especially when you get people like on a large scale to change, that means government structures are going to have to change. And I don't think they want to, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's what it is. I think it's a lot of people like not out of like not wanting to know, but out of not being told, you know. Um, yeah, I, yeah, completely. And it's, you know, it's sometimes it's overwhelming um, that whole, you know, that whole kind of system change narrative and mm. where do you focus and you know if you play within the rules you know you, you're kind of doomed because we don't have the time and if you play outside the rules then you're you're disrupting everyone's lives and it's like yeah but hey everyone's lives ain't going to be happening if we don't get on with this stuff yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, to be honest like especially with disruption i do feel bad i'm not gonna lie there have been times i've stood in the road and i'm like maybe i should get out of the road <laughs> but then i think okay so the disruption we're going to face in our lifetime, even just like not even just the climate crisis, but all the other social issues that we're ignoring is going to be far worse than me stopping, you know, John from getting to the bank on a Tuesday morning, you know. And when you actually start looking at it as a comparison, like maybe we do need to take a bit of discomfort now in hopes to save the future for us, you know. And if that's something that's going to have to happen, I apologize for having to do it because we shouldn't have to do it. Um, but we're going to have to do it, you know? Yeah, and there's a little bit of this kind of like, again, the sort of modern human, uh, the modern industrial human, their sense, our sense of time scale as well. We're only kind of looking at the, what's in front of us. Mm-hmm. We're looking at our short. We're not really, again, able to compute farther ahead. We're not able to think of, you know, future generations or ancestors down the line. We don't seem to have that ability, do you know what I mean? Or again, mm-hmm. that sort of empathy to think, actually what we're doing now again it's this consequence piece there's no, there's no sense of consequence to this story that we're all a part of um and i and, and i'm with you as well i mean my sense is again culture has a huge role to play um in these in these coming months and years to help us sort of start to perceive the world differently back to where we were you know to see to help us understand you know this interconnectivity this 
interdependence that we're all you know we are you know <laughs> you know the fate the the fate of all of us is in the hands of all of us <laughs> you know it's not a okay. um and, and but i think there is a big role for culture to sort of help help this um our, our species really sort of raise that consciousness understand that so we so mm-hmm. we demand these kinds of shifts because i i worry without again you know through our traditional system as it as it is are we going to get those um those breakthroughs you 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 um i'd love to talk a little bit if we can about eco anxiety because again mm-hmm. another 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 thing that's been you know around for a long long time but it's starting to sort of you know you're hearing a lot more about this i know that your some of your work is 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 involved again with 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 younger people particularly personally i can relate because i have suffered massively from this and still mm-hmm. do but it's still there but i'd love you if you could just again just talk a bit to it so listeners who i think would be really interested in to understand more about this yeah, so so eco anxiety is basically feeling anxious about the environment and the state that we're in. Coming way more common, especially in young kids. Like even for example, like Greta Thunberg through eco anxiety, she actually went into selective mutism. Um, so it does, it can have a really traumatic effect on young people. Um, but at least with a lot of the work that I do, it's focusing on how we can acknowledge when it's happening, but also how we can aid young people to not feel anxious and to feel empowered um, to get through it. Because I know I have, you know, I still experience eco-anxiety. To be honest, I I experience social collapse anxiety Mm -hmm. (laughs) a lot of the time, especially when you start seeing, you know, scenes of the US and things like that that's only happened in the past couple of months. It feels very real. Um, But we need to allow our young people to be able to experience this grief and we need to especially as older people hold them within this grief and allow them to acknowledge the loss of biodiversity the loss of the future that they thought that they would live but also making sure that they know that we're here to hold and I think that's a really important part and I think especially for my own journey you know I I started uni thinking I'm going to be in sex historian boy boy am I wrong now (laughs) you know I'm leaving uni and I'm looking for ways I can help the earth you know and I had to kind of throw away the ideas I thought I would have about my youth I thought I would spend summers in Ibiza but I'm spending summers going around telling people to listen to to what's happening and fight for the climate you know so it's like it's it's the the loss of the life we thought we would live but we need to be held in that. And when I was held in that, I started to feel like it's okay to be sad about things that are happening, but also having spaces of where I can really channel channel my agency into and know that I have the power to help change things. And I think, especially for young people, that's what we need to make sure that they don't feel helpless and it, the issue doesn't feel so big that they can't do anything, that all they can do is just feel horrible about it, but that they can actually have agency within the issue and create solutions that will end up fighting climate change. And where is that, you know, again, I guess, where, where can people look to sort of explore this in more detail? Or, you know, what, what, what is there any kind of examples, you know, of people, I guess, or projects that are sort of working with this issue with young people in an interesting way? Yeah, there are loads of projects, um, lo- lots of projects. Um, I know that the Force for Nature does a lot of work on eco-anxiety, um, with Clover, the um, CEO. Um, but to be honest, I actually, I go for a more like an intuitive approach. Um, yeah, I feel that. That, um, we all know how we're feeling um, and we all know what we need to do. But sometimes, especially in a modern world like this, of where we don't look in and we don't self-reflect very often, we kind of lose focus of what our bodies can tell us you know um so personally especially when I'm doing this with some young people I want them to like give them props to connect to themselves you know ask them why are they feeling like this is there anything that particularly like is there like a a certain image that evokes these feelings and things like this and really creating like a a, like a tool that they can use forever so it's not just a workshop that will make you feel great for two weeks and then it comes back but having like some real easy step tools of one figuring out how you feel but also figuring out how you can get out of it as well and there's so many you know techniques that you can use in doing this yeah and there's um i love all this because i think again this is this is it comes back to that thing isn't it sort of like you know this it's a sort of it's an inside job sustainability sometimes and 
you know, just this idea of just helping people tune in to, to this extraordinary kind of human technology that we all have, right? Again, whether mm-hmm. that, you know, intuition and our capacity to kind of sense and all these incredible things, which I think, again, probably we can learn so much from indigenous cultures who are still practicing Mm. but again like bringing these into this into this modern world and helping more people be able to tune into these things because i'm I'm totally with you i think a lot of this you know living this regenerative uh future or or building regenerative cultures you know it's Mm. it is you know it requires this this kind of um a set of tools really which you can you know which we're able to use and with agency and you know tune in to what's going on and understand exactly. ourselves better yeah exactly and especially like you know like as one part of regenerative cultures i always talk about self-care but this is what i mean by self-care it's not just the physical you know making sure you're eating well and having enough sleep and stuff like that but it's like finding out what part you play in society um what have you exalt like you know what have you like taken from this toxic system that we've grown up in and how we can make ourselves better you know and and this is like the the real beauty of some of like the inner work that really needs to be done especially when combating climate change this is how we'll start you know making space for people who haven't been heard before this is how we'll start to understand what can you know what can I bring? What are the skills that I can bring to my community? How can I work best with my community and things like this? It's it's very much like I do think that a lot of it does start from understanding the self a lot better. And you can feel so empowered just by knowing yourself, you know, and knowing what you can do, what you feel like you have boundaries around um, and, and being really like honest, but also quite vigilant about um, what's happening within you. Um, you know, I, I think it, it's really important to really check in with yourself very often. Yeah. And it, and, it, and it's, um, cause I, I get, this is great. Cause there's this whole, I think again, you know, you just, you spoke to this before about, you know, we're in this, you know, you're caught in this kind of perpetual cycle of money and shelter and food and all this stuff, but actually if you strip it back again, you know, and you, someone was talking the other day about, you know, what it is to be free and, you know, as a, you know, as a, you know, it, it, as a you know as a non-human as a creature it's to be able to sort of it's to be able to roam and explore a territory right and it's to be yeah. able to sort of feed yourself and express yourself and uh <laughs> you know and 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 actually again you know because again what you know if if we were able to you know have some food sovereignty grow some food or have community uh, projects if we were able to creatively express ourselves we were able to sort of you know however you know there's a million ways of doing that if we were able to connect with others in community more easily if we could have cleaner air to breathe and a natural world around us to sort of be in awe of how much shit would we want to buy anyway (laughs) (laughs) right because like isn't that i think this is the thing right the whole thing is 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 sort of designed to sort of extract all of that stuff which actually doesn't cost doesn't cost but it's it's an intentional it's what we you know it's, it's whether we value that and Exactly. Exactly. And that yeah, there is something quite beautiful, especially like to me, I see myself very much as part of nature. I, I don't think you can, you know, like you can really pull like humans out of nature. And I think that's partly what we've done wrong for so long. It's yeah. seeing the environment as something that's just this one green space rather than see it as the way that all of us on this earth interact with one another. Um and it's like I, I think that when we do have these moments to really like check in with ourselves and also especially when you start taking off the burden of, you know, like making sure you have a house, making sure you have these signs of security, especially as someone who grew up in poverty. Like I still know I've got a lot to work on when it comes to financial security, because even when I think I have enough money. I am so scared of not having enough money. They actually start acting a little bit crazy, you know, and it's like even my own awareness of that allows me to work through it a lot better and when we start stripping back our lives into the more simpler things that can actually provide such joy and even like scientifically is proven to help reduce anxiety and help us live healthier and happier lives um that's when I think we'll really start to question some of the things that we've been told in our lives about buying things and that bringing joy and things like that we would really start to understand that joy is a lot of things that can give joy is, is mostly free. <laughs> yeah, right. And the problem is this whole this whole model of 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 you know how we've now ended up 
organizing ourselves around production and consumption you know just you know it completely is completely dependent on on energy and and natural materials so you know the more we encourage people to buy houses and cars and clothes and this the more we the faster we destroy the living world that that supports us so it's mm-hmm. so it's all you know it's pathological really now the the the, the, the direction we, we're heading in or the mm-hmm. stories that we're being told to pursue because you know we're bringing it down right and so mm-hmm. and so there is this there is this moment like you say where well it's gonna be an interesting year isn't it because i guess it's, it's it's cop 26 just i mean let's just because we you know i'd love to know your thoughts on that like what what do, you, what do you what do you you know what does good look like what are you hoping for that might happen because it's, it's huge in many ways yeah. isn't it in terms of intention and back to politics where we started yeah i always have really mixed feelings about cop there's one part of me that is an optimist and want to see the change that we need to see. And I mean radical change. I mean aiming for targets that we might not achieve, but they're so ambitious that we will get so much closer than a 2050 target, you know. Um, I want governments to start bringing communities into decision-making when it comes to COP. I don't want COP to happen that's very far and detached from the rest of the community i want you know stakeholders to be brought in and have time to discuss with governments um and bringing you know the power back to the people as we say in you know in like democracy um i also do think that there is you know the optimism side of me sees like cop is such a beautiful time because you see everyone working to get together towards it and i think that's like arguably one of the most beautiful things about COP. It's seeing communities, organisations, NGOs, even governments coming together to say, we are going to do something really amazing. But then there also is the side of, we are on our 26 and have we seen the change that we need? No. And I feel like there is also like every year, there's also such like a couple of months of real disappointment in the fact that so many amazing organizations came together and did so much amazing stuff, but we still aren't being heard and they're still not taking this seriously. Um, so yeah, so it, it's very much like I, I have mixed feelings. I do think that the community at Foster's is really amazing and makes it worthwhile, but also I am so sick and tired of not enough happening and not enough being done. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it it does feel like this this the the, the kind of um, the pressure on this one is immense because you know I mean every every way you look at it and you 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 would hope sort of culturally media from this you'd, you'd hope that you know if, if ever there was going to be a breakthrough it would be now but that re- is going to require like you say to bring community in I mean I you know when you're talking about that I'm like yes yes but then I'm thinking. I'm thinking like, you know, the current, what is it? Like, isn't there like two women in the UK team? Not even, and that's only, then it wasn't all men to begin with in uh, yeah. the leadership oh. team. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, especially with like, you know, when you're looking at like gender is one of the easiest to understand because it, it literally affects 50% of the world. Um, <laughs> you know, technically I think it's even like 51% of the world or something are like females. And if we can't get that, how are we going to start including people with disabilities? How are we going to start including working class communities? How are we going to understand how to include people as part of intersectionality if we can't get gender inclusion right? Mm. No, it's it's huge, isn't it? it get, getting these things, like you say, like this, this, this sort of true diversity principle, you know, if we can't reflect that in the in the sort of you know in in the sort of the 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 leadership team then yeah you 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 got you got to uh yeah you got a question i guess the the that stuff so i guess it's interesting because there's a campaign running on that at the moment isn't there about trying to trying to make that um you know, yeah, this, I think this it's representation. The climate. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I so, signed the letter because I, I like you know I do think there is a part of me that is like maybe cop in itself isn't the right way to do it um but i have no suggestions of what to do so i'm going to be quiet <laughs> <laughs> well, no. i was you trying know. to i was just trying to think who's who's the marcus rashford of of climate in the uk <laughs> that can just, like, you know because we've got to, you know it's all yeah. the solution, but i think all of us could come together and create the solution i think that i'm yeah. very much like a true believer in us all of us coming together to create solutions because that's how we're gonna end up covering all bases is because everyone would have an experience of something that would have happened if you get what I mean yeah Uh, 
so you know no one will be forgotten and that's that's really important to me I know. I remember. I remember when it was when it went. You know, because we thought COP was was due to be last year, wasn't with the pandemic. But I was, mm. I was imagining at the time I was chatting to. Uh, uh, we were like, well, you know, what would what would it look like if, like, you know, if if, if you know, could you get a million people in the country to go to Glasgow? Could you get you, know, you get could you get half a million people to go to Glasgow and literally surround the thing and just not let any world leaders out until <laughs> until a proper deal's done? Because you know you you can't. <laughs> you can't no I'm on board with. Do <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not coming out. No one's going home until you've done a proper deal. Because, um, like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't get rid of half a million people, can you? I mean, you can. I mean, surely there's that many people that care about the future. Anyway, no. there's a thought. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, listen, um, thinking about this year, is there is anything out, any other sort of projects or things that, you know, you know, we can find you or you want to shout about or anything Hello. that. Um, to be honest, I, I, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a weird one of where I like doing my projects, but I don't like people knowing they're my projects. Um, yeah. I feel like, I don't know. I, I think like maybe it's me. I'm trying to take the ego out of it, if you get what I mean. I feel yeah. that the work in itself should should like grow within itself, you know, and also there is some stuff around legality of some stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. We'll, we'll keep our eyes peeled but yeah, uh, I think, yeah i think it's just like especially at a time of where there is so much activity on climate and on social justice issues like get involved you know that's what i think there there is so much in so many different ways and the way i see it is that we're all one machine working for the future we deserve and even, you know, like the road blockers who glue themselves to floors are in support of the people who are signing petitions, are in support of the people who are, you know, sitting down and um, talking to their local MPs. Like all of us doing this work is going to, is what gets to change. And there are so many different options of different like levels of comfortability that you can come into um, activism with. So I, I think everyone should be thinking about how can I better this world? And keep that as a question that they ask themselves every day for 2021. Love that. Love that. Thank you for that. Um, so listen, um, I always, I always, which you're sort of starting to speak to, I guess I close the, always close the, the episode with, with this idea of thinking of the spaceship earth and this idea of becoming crew on the spaceship earth. And what does, yes. what does that, what does that mean to you right now? Oh my God. It actually, it reminds me of Extinction Rebellion because we actually say in our meetings, we are all crew because all of us yeah. have hands in this, you know, and all of us will work together to build a better future for the earth and for every living thing on that, you know? So that's why I, 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 I love the phrase we are all crew because it shows that all of us are worker bees you know we're all here together for each other and that's the most important part of all the work we're doing because if we didn't have love and care at the heart of it why, why would we do it you know beautiful thank you days um thank you. <laughs> it's been great to chat to you i um I really hope um, I'm, you know, just look forward to following, following your trails this year. And 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 I'm, I'm totally agree. There's so there is so much great energy and um, you know people doing extraordinary things all over the place. And I think that different those different flavors of activism is just so important. I know a sense of people some think you know for many people that you know their vision of activism is is very is often very frontline and often you know chaining yeah. themselves up and whatever but actually of course it comes in so many forms just to act uh, exactly. on, on something bigger than ourselves so yeah love it so i hope you enjoyed that conversation with days um quite a force in inspiring human and doing yeah beautiful important and brilliant work in the world um and uh, i th i have this sense we're going to see a lot of a lot from days in the coming years um yeah and i hope it's kind of inspired you uh into into action this is an enormous year it's hard with covid and like all the kind of mind melding sort of impacts of that it's sometimes hard just to go hey, what, what, what do i do and what do i have energy for but you know bring us back to kind of the climate and ecological crisis it is the mother of all you know it's the thing that supports all of it you know um it supports all life this is the thing that you know we we have no civilization if we don't um radically uh reimagine how we show up on this planet and 
you know, in amongst all the sort of carnage of what's going on, you know, there is a possibility of something way more beautiful. That's the thing. It's sometimes it's quite hard to think, oh, but you know, surely we're at the pinnacle of human achievement and uh, nothing else is possible. And, uh, you know, but for many, it's it's really bad and it's always been really bad um, as we're finding out. But, you know, I really, I don't think anyone really is satisfied, are they, with with this, this way of being? Um Surely we can do something better, and that is that is the uh, the inspiration for climate ecological action, for action on these intersectional crises around social and racial justice. They're all interlinked. They're all part of a a system which is eating itself, um, and and everyone and everything that uh, that that creates it supports it. So huge year and um, so many ways to take action, you know, frontline or just, you know, reimagining life where you live. Um, you know, showing up differently days talk just of that beauty of just, you know, the kindness of just how we show ourselves to our other um, fellow humans and and non-human beings around us and uh yeah there's there's enormous power in just how we start to create the future we desire through the things that come out of our mouths and the actions that we take in the everyday moments um so yeah whatever your flavor of change there's so much to do and uh we can't create this more beautiful world without everyone so you know no biggie. Leave you leave you with that. Um, if you like the podcast, please do share it. Um, give us a rating if you do like what you're hearing. Um, it takes a lot to put these podcasts together. And if you do like something, I know sometimes it's like, it take, will take 30 seconds, you know, on Apple or Spotify, whatever it is that you listen to. But it makes lots of difference. Little, you know, little cheeky review, little cheeky rating. Go on, go on. So yeah, um, take care of yourself. We talked a lot about that whole tuning into our our inner wisdom and our beautiful kind of inner technologies that we have, like intuition and our kind of sensory capacities. And these all feel part of part of the things we kind of need to need to sort of reinvigorate, getting out of our heads into our bodies, connecting with this uh, wider web of life around us. So um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'm going to play out with a track. It's a track that's been playing a lot in my kitchen of late and uh, it feels just like it just feels appropriate for this episode. Um, so it's called People Help the People. It's by amazing British singer songwriter Birdie. Um, it was released in 2011, although it's actually a cover version with the original written by a band called Cherry Ghost in 2007. So there we have it. Until next time, peace and out.
be cold as a star. 